Derby Wars, racing's biggest contest site is now even bigger with more than 200 games every day. Check out Survivor, Derby Wars' hottest new game. It's fun, easy to play, and for just four bucks, you could win a grand. Just pick a horse to finish first, second, or third and advance to the next race. With daily payouts and games starting every hour, you'll see why fans are racing to play Survivor. Go to DerbyWars.com now, use promo code SURVIVOR to get five free Survivor games with your first deposit. Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I'm terrific, Brian. It's great to be uh, doing the show with you. It, it snuck up on me. I think there's only four big 100-point derby preps left, and there's a lot of horses that need some points. So we got big races to talk about. Perhaps no one bigger needing points than McCracken, and we're going to talk about that big bluegrass on Saturday at Keeneland here in a moment, Matt. But let's go backwards first. We need to talk about a few big derby preps that happened last Saturday, and we're going to start down in South Florida. We're always dreaming. Had been a horse people have been talking about for a while. He got some foundation as a two-year-old. The son of Bodie Meister is undefeated in three starts this year, and his graded stakes debut was a big one in the Florida Derby, sir. It sure was. It was uh, it was a wild performance from the young Todd Pletcher runner. Uh, uh, real fast time, one forty seven and change, a, a a good buyer speed figure, and, and he smacked that field, drew away, won uh, by five lengths or so. Uh, Pletcher is on a roll, Brian. Pletcher has seven legitimate top three-year-old Colts right now, Matt. That's just crazy. I don't know if all seven will be in the Kentucky Derby, but yeah, he's he is loaded, although we know his one for just about forever record in the Kentucky Derby going into this year. So we'll see how they do. Always dreaming, as I said, a son of Bodie Meister who kind of came on late on the scene uh, in his year, just like his son always dreaming and ran big in both the Derby and Preakness to be second. I'll have another. This is also a half-brother to Hot Dixie Chick, Last time we saw slow, slow, slow fractions in an easy allowance optional claimer winner. He proved he could run fast here in the uh, Gulfstream Park big one, the Florida Derby. He even got steadied a little bit uh, going into the first turn when three rules came over. Obviously a talented horse. He really did win uh, as he pleased in this one. A lot to ask, to, though, to go from optional claiming to the Florida Derby to the Kentucky Derby. It is, Brian, but... I don't know. It seems to be what everybody's doing. So, uh, you know, he uh, he did a great job uh, and he's shown a lot of versatility, like you said, different kinds of running. So who knows what to expect uh, in the in the derby from this one? Yeah, he's not going to be my top pick, Matt. I'll tell you that right now. Of course, we still have about four and a half weeks to go. So we don't know what exactly will shake out all the way to the first Saturday in May. But I suspect he won't be my top pick. Uh, but he is certainly talent to fear. He might even be the favorite. He certainly will be one of the favorites in the Derby. Now, on the other end of the spectrum in this race was Guna Vera, who was just lagging way back after breaking from the far outside in the field of 10. Javi took him to the rail. He was way back the whole race. On the good side, he continued to make up ground. Far turn stretch. He did nothing but rally. Nowhere near the winner, but he did get up for third. And Gunavera has an interesting pattern, Matt, since he started great at stakes. Win, lose, win, lose, win, lose. The next one will be the Kentucky Derby for the son of Dialed In. Yeah, Brian, uh, I don't really know how to take that performance um, except to say that, you know, he probably wasn't cranked up for the race and you talked about the pattern, and, and that seems to be what uh, trainer Antonio Sano is doing. So um, he's got the right kind of running style to, to do well in the derby, to weave around traffic, um, a little bit more experience from some of the others. So can't discount him. He's got a legitimate, sh little legitimate shot on the first Saturday in May, but... 
you know, that that performance was a little bit puzzling, maybe a little bit disappointing. Yeah, I, and I'm not taking it as negatively as some, Matt. I think this was a race he didn't need to win. Probably the post position played a little bit of part of it. But I think more than anything, the track, a very fast Gulfstream Park track at Nine Furlongs had a lot to do with it. Uh, it. It's never easy to come from way back in the Kentucky Derby, but I think this is a horse that's proven he can do that. Ten Furlongs, I really do like the way, even though the race was basically over for him, he kept coming and he, and he went from fifth to third in the last... 50 yards. So uh, if I was a Gunavera fan going into the Florida Derby, this race did not kick me off his bandwagon. I think Gunavera still has a real good shot at 10 furlongs at Churchill Downs with probably a little bit more pace pressure up front. But the winner was impressive. Always dreaming. It was all about always dreaming. State of honor, I've been saying for a while, is my Queens played horse. He had a little bit of trouble, but he doesn't quite look like a horse who's going to beat the very best of the Americans. But they are go- but they are going to the Derby. So yeah, they're going to the Derby, and and then and then after that, we'll probably see them in Canada back on top of the. So we'll see, but not one of the top Derby horses for me, Matt. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Just one more thing about Gunavera and the Derby, and the fans need to keep in mind it's going to be the first time going ten furlongs, and there are going to be a lot of tired horses. I don't think any of us doubt that Gunavera will be running at the end, and that gives him a big chance to win the race. Exactly, and and whether that that passing a lot of horses is for first, third, or seventh, we'll have to wait and see. But I think Gunavera is the most likely horse out of all of these horses to be passing horses in the stretch. Matt, speaking of passes, passing horses, Gervin has just had two perfect trips under Brian Hernandez, one on the rail, one on the outside. I watched this Louisiana Derby a few times. He was just in great position all the way. Uh, he didn't win off. Uh, I think Patch uh, Patch was a little over length behind him at the wire, and I think Patch ran a very good race for where he was. But Gervin just seems to do all the right things, despite being only four races deep into his career. Yeah, th- just what I was going to say, Brian, here's a horse that knows how to do the right things, and here's a horse that wants to compete and wants to win every race that he's been in, which he's done three out of four times, only one second place. And that was on the turf. And I saw your interview, which was terrific, with Brian Hernandez out uh, at Keeneland the other day. And, and he said that he didn't particularly like running on that turf course that day. Um, I like horses like that. I like horses that do the right thing and, and want to win. Again, back to what we said before, it's going to be 10 furlongs on the first Saturday in May. Is he going to be there at the end? He's got a good shot as anybody. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, Matt, to see who Brian Hernandez chooses. I think I think McCracken is the favorite at, at this point, but obviously Hernandez likes Gervin quite a bit, and he's had very good success riding Gervin. Uh, McCracken, of course, we already talked about a little bit, will be in the bluegrass on Saturday, so that will help Mr. Hernandez make his decision, a big derby decision for the young, uh, the young Louisiana native. Now, this horse uh, also has, uh, has some family. He's the son of Taylor Vacati, who was uh, a very nice horse, probably at middle distances was his best distance. Uh, he's out of a Malibu moon mare named Catch the Moon, though, and, and Catch the Moon has already produced cocked and loaded a, a multiple stakes winner. So Gervin's bred to be a good one. Not sure about 10 furlongs yet, and I'm not sure if he's as fast as some of the very best in the division. But Gervin, you know, I, I would not talk anyone off of Gervin if they think he can win the Kentucky Derby. Yep, I feel the same way. And, and of course, Brian Hernandez does have a little bit more of a long-standing relationship with trainer Ian Wilkes of McCracken. So that could factor into the decision. Yeah, and Gervin trained by young Joe Sharp. Uh, who's married to Rosie Napravnik, who rides this horse in the mornings. Uh, uh, on the other side, Ian Wilkes, as you mentioned, was the trainer of Fort Larned, who uh, Brian Hernandez rode to uh, Breeders' Cup Classic victory. Matt, I think we do need to mention a few other horses in the Louisiana Derby. Local hero just held on for third. He doesn't look like a derby horse to me. Guess Suite was disappointing well back in the field. But I thought Patch. Patch only had two maiden races going in. He had just a little bit of traffic uh, coming out of the turn early in the stretch. And he really came on nicely on the rail. 
I don't know if it's it, it, it's going to manifest itself as soon as the Derby, but Patch, the one-eyed horse, Patch, looks like a horse to watch in the future also for Todd Pletcher. Yes, and that's what just what I was going to say, Brian. Uh, we're sounding like a broken record. All those things you just said, it's easy to guess who the trainer is. It's Todd Pletcher. It's Todd Pletcher. Well, for the Kentucky Oaks, I don't think we're going to be talking a ton about Todd Pletcher yet, but we need to talk about Farrell. Farrell, of course, is the uh, talking about half siblings here. Farrell, of course, is a half sister to Carpe Diem, Grade One winner of the Bluegrass. Farrell is also a da daughter of Malibu Moon. She's won four straight stakes, Matt. And this Fairground Oaks, it wasn't the deepest, strongest field in the world, but she just won for fun. She sure did. She she uh, has got you know speed and and does everything right and finds the winner's circle and has beaten up on the competition down there in Louisiana um, without unique uh, Bella in the Oaks. Uh, it's looking like uh, Farrell's going to be either the favorite or very close to being the favorite in the Oaks. Yeah, Farrell, uh, four straight wins, stakes wins, and she's done them all easily, going back to last fall at Churchill Downs in the grade two Goldenrod. Now she dominated uh, New Orleans this spring, won all three of their three-year-old Philly stakes. I think she deserves to be the Kentucky Oaks favorite, Matt. And, and yeah, the fact that she could wire a race or she could sit third and fourth and make her move makes her a very attractive filly for just about any kind of race. Uh, nine furlongs doesn't look like it'll be a problem for her. There are a few good uh, up-and-coming quality road fillies, though, that we need to talk about. And that, that'll be a transition over back to South Florida, Matt, for the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Gulfstream Park Oaks, that is. And uh, Salty. Salty is a daughter of Quality Road. She, too, just like Patch, only had two maiden races to her record going into the Gulfstream Park Oaks. But she won this like a very good thing. She sure did. And again, maybe it wasn't the toughest field in the world out there. But for, a, for an inexperienced filly, uh, um, she really ran terrific. Uh, uh, just handled that field as easily as she pleased for the connections of Mark Cassie and Joel Rosario. Joel's having a pretty good meeting, having a good uh, spring, being selective and getting on some good horses uh, in terms of what he rides. Yeah, th this, was a, this was a good one, Matt. I, I guess the margin was a little bit more than uh, Farrell won the Fairgrounds Oaks. I thought Farrell did it even easier than Salty, uh, but Salty made a sustained run where she... Uh, came from uh, medium far back in the field and just ran right by him on the turn into the stretch. She may have been uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit leg weary in the Gulfstream Park Oaks late at a mile 16th, but that's to be expected. She should get a lot out of this race and only get better. I'm not sure if I have her quite up with Farrell yet or another quality road filly, Abel Tasman. Uh, Abel Tasman's going to run in the Santa Anita Oaks on Saturday. She, of course, ran second to unique Bella last time. So I'm excited about that quality road filly. I'm excited about this quality road filly. I did actually think this field was better than what Farrell beat in the Fairground Oaks for what it's worth. Yeah, you know, both of them, both of the fields were okay. Neither of the fields was uh, was particularly great. And, and it looks like we'll see after the Santa Anita Oaks, if Abel Tasman does well, uh, Abel Tasman and Farrell will be battling for favoritism uh, on the Friday before the Derby. Agreed, Matt. We have the Ashland as well. So there's a lot going on. The Gazelle for three-year-old fillies as we move closer to the Oaks. But I think you're right on. Farrell is confirmed as one of the two favorites. And Abel Tasman, depending on what she does in the Santa Anita Oaks, would be the other favorite. But Salty is certainly one to watch. Matt, always dreaming Gervin, Farrell, and Salty all threw their name in for the Derby and the Oaks as, as strong contenders. What are we going to see this week? We have three big preps. I'd like to say three grade one preps this weekend. But, of course, we can't say that this year, Matt. The Bluegrass, the Wood Memorial were downgraded to grade twos. And uh, that, uh, that uh, doesn't seem to be the case as far as quality of the fields this year, especially, Matt, the Bluegrass at Keeneland on Saturday. Especially the bluegrass, uh, Brian. I, I, I don't think the, that that grade two may last uh, more than one year with the field that's in there. It's a field, Brian, that if, if we take a look at the top 
four contenders in that race. It's a it's a group that has between them 161 Kentucky Derby points already. So uh, you know, a couple of them in there that already have enough. Three of them already have enough points probably to get in there, and it's McCracken who has 20 points who needs to to get a few more to get into the field. Yeah, that's interesting, Matt. McCracken, I think, uh, is is tops or near the top on a lot of people's lists, including ours. Uh, the son of Ghost Zapper has been nothing but good in all four starts. He, he likes to run late. He's very professional. Another Brian Hernandez horse, as we mentioned, for Ian Wilkes. Uh, McCracken seems like the real deal. He had a slight setback that caused him to miss the Tampa Bay Derby, but now he's working very well. As you mentioned, Brett Workman and I were out at the workout on Sunday morning. McCracken looking good. McCracken is the horse to beat in the bluegrass, but McCracken could run a very good race in the bluegrass and get beat, Matt, because this is a strong field. The three that I think you were talking about, in addition to McCracken, include Taprit, a very impressive winner of the Tampa Bay Derby after running second behind McCracken in the Sam F. Davis, a very good second. Jay Boy's Echo is an improving Dale Romans runner who uh, looked awfully good in the Gotham beating Cloud Computing and Ella Reeb, which I think is a better Gotham than we've seen a lot in recent years. And then, of course, Practical Joke, who was a very strong two-year-old, won the Champagne, third in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And Practical Joke ran a decent race in his return, went second in the Fountain of Youth. I'll throw in the others that I know, Wild Shot, uh, It's Your Nickel, and I Wrap. And all three of those are capable of running with the top four at their best. So it, it's an interesting field. And uh, like I said, I, I, McCracken is the horse to beat in here, but uh, wouldn't be a surprise at all if he is beaten. Yeah, Brian, because uh, he's only had that one race this year, the Sam F. Davis. That's a couple months ago. And and even if he runs a big one, he he's entitled to maybe be a little short, especially when you're running against this kind of competition. J-Boy's Echo uh, ran fantastic. And, and uh, Dale Romans, I'm sure, will be telling us all this week about how that horse has been getting better and better and better. Um, and, and Chad Brown can do wonders with horses with uh, Practical Joke and Taprit. Uh, Todd Pletcher, um, that's a tough field and a talented field. Yeah, and the way Pletcher's been rolling of late, Matt, you have to give an extra look to Taprit. And looking back at that Sam F. Davis, he really did have some traffic trouble mid-stretch before coming out and and running on. McCracken was the winner all the way, but Taprit ran a very good race that day. And then, of course, the Tampa Bay Derby, he was much the best. So that was a, a validation of the good form from the Sam F. Davis. Uh, of the of the next two favorites, Jay Boy's Echo and Practical Joke, I think one of them is more of a likely 10 furlong horse. And people that have been watching the show for a while know that, for me, that's going to be Jay Boy's Echo as opposed to Practical Joke, who I think is more likely going to have a career as a very good miler. But Jay Bowie's Echo is an interesting derby horse. I don't know if he beats McCracken or Taprit here, but uh, 10 furlongs, if he keeps improving, certainly an interesting horse. So yep. the bluegrass is a big one. Yep, but without question, uh, Jay Bowie's Echo is, uh, you know, we said that about Gunavera. Jay Bowie's Echo is one of the horses who's likely to still have some run at the end of the derby. Agree. All right, Matt, let's shift from uh, the bluegrass of Kentucky in the bluegrass to the Wood Memorial, the historic Wood Memorial. Hasn't had a Kentucky Derby winner lately, but there's some very interesting horses in here. No Kentucky Derby favorites per se, Matt, but I think two of the most interesting lightly raced horses, up and coming horses, uh, AK uh, a la Always Dreaming about a week ago, and maybe even more highly regarded by some in Battalion Runner and Cloud Computing. And then you have two horses that were high on people's lists a little while ago, but disappointed in their in their most recent race, and that's Irish War Cry and Motown. I think either one of those two could bounce back big, and I think either one of Battalion Runner or Cloud Computing could turn out to be really good. Yeah, I think the Wood Memorial, different, very different from the Bluegrass in the sense of looking ahead to the Kentucky Derby. This is a race where trainers and owners, they're pushing their chips all in here on the Wood Memorial. They need points and, and they are not all gonna get enough points out of this race to, to get to the Derby. Battalion Runner has no points. Um, but as you said, Brian, out of 
all of these Pletcher horses who have shown so much in the last couple months, Battalion Runner maybe is the one that was at the top of everybody's list and maybe in that barn. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that horse is, uh, does, owned by Vinny Viola, who also is an owner of Always Dreaming. Pletcher's been keeping those apart, and thus Battalion Runners at, at the Wood Memorial. Um, cloud Computing, like you said, for Chad Brown. Ran a really nice race in the Gotham second to J-Boy's Echo, but he, he was way, way, way ahead of the rest of the field. Could definitely, uh, definitely be getting better. And, and Motown... Um, and Irish War Cry both have ten points and need to get uh, need to get at least a third place to have a chance of running in the in the Derby. Yeah, Matt. Uh, all four are interesting, and all four are kind of interesting for different reasons. If I had to pick one right now, it would be Cloud Computing. If we go back to that Gotham Stakes where J, J Boy Zeko got a perfect rallying trip after a contentious pace, it was Cloud Computing that really, really ran a good race uh, to be second. Cloud Computing contested that contested pace. Uh, it was uh, his second lifetime race, uh, only a sprint beforehand. Uh, Chad Brown certainly is one of the best trainers in, in, in the world. And this horse, despite only having two starts, uh, I, I just am pretty high on. I, I love his looks. And I look at that Gotham and the way he ran and the way he finished after J Boy Zeko kind of ran by pretty easily, pace uh, the pace helped him run by pretty easily, and I think J Boy Zeko, as we said, is, is becoming a very good horse. But the way Cloud Computing uh, ran down that stretch and and really wasn't giving much at all to J Boy Zeko the final sixteenth of a mile uh, and pulling away easily from El Arib, I think Cloud Computing is a horse with a world of potential, and I would like to see him step up in the wood. And one, one thing that I think is really to his advantage is that he's got a race over the track at uh, Aqueduct. I know it was inner, now we're on the main track, but, but he's run on the deep kind of surface of Aqueduct and as opposed to Battalion Runner, who uh, has been, you know, his race was at Gulfstream and he's been training down in Florida. Uh, that's a little bit different. Uh, cloud Computing has been training up here. Uh, at Belmont, so a little bit of a home track advantage that may serve him well. And we'd have to say the same about Motown, who of course looked so good late last year and won the nine for a long Remsen. So he's done it over the track and at the distance. Matt, there's one more big one uh, Saturday, and that's the Santa Anita Derby. I already mentioned Abel Tasman is going to be in the Santa Anita Oaks, and she is clearly the one to beat there. But in the Santa Anita Derby, I have a hard time telling you who the one to beat is. I could mention Iliad, Reach the World, Battle of Midway, Gormley, Royal Mo, American Anthem, West Coast. Who else, Matt? It's 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 a wide open race. It is certainly a wide open race, and it's a wide open race where we're kind of pitting horses that have some experience on the Derby Trail. Some of them have wins like Royal Mo and 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 Gormley, uh, but then disappointed big time in their next starts. Iliad ran a super race in the San Felipe. There's nothing wrong with saying you finished second to mastery. Uh, that's a feather in your cap. Uh, uh, Doug O'Neill is putting a bunch of horses in there. Baffert's got a bunch of horses in there. They're trying to find themselves a derby horse. And you've got that gang compared to a couple of youngsters in Battle of Midway and reach the world, we're both coming out of an allowance race at Santa Anita. So we got the youngsters, more of those inexperienced types against a little more experience. I don't know, Brian, I think I might like those two from the allowance race better than the rest of the others. Yeah, that was a very contentious and interesting allowance race. I thought the second place finisher reached the world for Bob Baffer probably was best that day. Uh, he kept coming in the stretch after after running wider, and I thought Battle of Midway got a little bit better trip. Reach the World uh, has been talked about. Don Alberto racing the Son of Tappet uh, as a potential very good horse. So no surprise. I think he's going to get bet quite a bit in the Santa Anita Derby. Uh, Gormley and Royal Mo need to bounce back. Neither were uh, were strong last time for, for John Sheriffs, uh, as does American Anthem. West Coast has the potential to be good. 
But I think if we had to pinpoint one as the favorite, Matt, uh, I think Reach the World will be close. But I think it's still Iliad. San Vicente was very impressive. Then he came up to uh, two turns. And yeah, clearly second best to Mastery, better than Gormley for sure. So Iliad uh, for Doug O'Neill uh, might be the horse to beat in here. And uh, yeah, if you, if you were a fan of Mastery like so many of us were, uh, Iliad is, is a natural horse to kind of take over the West Coast division right now. Yeah, he deserves to be favorite, and he probably will. I think uh, question marks about that horse going... Uh, beyond the distance of the Santa Anita Derby to the Kentucky Derby, but but that's okay, one race at a time. Um, but I think, like you said, Brian, Reach the World is going to be one of those buzz horses who uh, probably takes a lot of money and maybe will make it hard for uh, some of us to bet that horse if, if we were looking to do it. Yeah, it should be interesting, Matt. The Santa Anita Derby wide open, the Wood Memorial, four very interesting horses. The bluegrass is probably the best prep of all leading to the Kentucky Derby. So we're going to have, we're going to enjoy a big Saturday of racing as we get ever closer to the Kentucky Derby. Folks, I want to thank you for watching Horse Center every week as we get close to the Kentucky Derby, talking Derby with us. Thank you to our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. Any closing shots from you, Matt? I Like you said, Brian, we're, we're certainly going to have uh, a list of, almost a full list of derby contenders after this weekend and and it's going to be great to watch and as always we can't do the show without our fine fine producer brett workman brett workman indeed brett and i are going to make a lot of trips out in the next month uh, to churchill downs to see these horses in the morning so stay tuned to horse center and horse racing nation for as much kentucky derby talk as you can handle folks see you next week